So when you think about Sam, to understand how he came to be here, you have to understand the story. And so I want to give you a little bit of the story. And the story starts in Italy, in Sicily, actually, in Messina. And it's a little town, well, it's not that little, it was 150,000 at that time, that that's where his family was. And Giovanni went to America in 1904 to be a cobbler. And Sam's great-grandmother, Angela, was there with the three kids, one of which was his grandfather, Sam's grandfather, who is uh, Frank Petania, the senior. So what happened that's so interesting when you think about this history is in Messina on December 28th of 1908, there was a massive earthquake and a tsunami, and it wiped out the entire city. And his great-grandmother, Angela, had a vision right before the earthquake. A saint had come to her in her sleep and said, get out of the bed, death. She left with the children, she went outside, and the entire town went to smoke. Her house got crashed, and she was homeless. So her husband's in New York City, she's homeless with three little children, and so she has to get to America. So on May 26, they actually make it to America. They go on a ship called the SS San Gigioni, and this ship takes them to a new life. Now, without the angel, without this, you're not here. And <laughs> the grandfather, Frank, is born July 4th, 1899. Interesting, he picks that that day, July 4th, is when he's going to be born. So they show up in, in New York, and it's May 26th of 1909. That's when they get there. Now think about what's happening when they arrive. New York City at that time was alive with immigrants. On the two years earlier, they had the largest amount of immigrants that had ever come through Ellis Island. You had one million people come through in 1907. So they arrive. It's bristling with lots of immigrants, and technology is changing. So lots of things are changing. That same year, September 29th of 1909, you had Wilbur Wright go around the Statue of Liberty. And this, your grandfather may have seen. It would have been in the newspapers. It would have been a big deal. That's the same year Geronimo died, as well as Frederick Remington. So this is the setting for his birth. Now, Sam's, when they, they his, his grandfather is, he has no education. He's 10 years old when he comes to the New World. And he has worked as a goldsmith from about age 6 to 10 in Italy. He comes over here. He works numerous jobs. He doesn't really get an education. He works in a torpedo factory, so he doesn't have to attend the war of in 1917. He goes through the 1918 uh, pandemic as well. So what happens is he starts working with a company, the largest goldsmith company and jewelry company in the world. And it's called Goldsmith Stern Company. And very interesting, the man who runs this, one of the owners, a guy named Nathan uh, Stern. And Nathan Stern takes a trip. And the trip is to Santa Fe. So he likes cars. He wants to go see the country. And he goes to Santa Fe. And he falls in love with that. He buys some property. He buys some businesses. And so without this trip, Sam's not here. <laughs> and here's why. <laughs> Frank, in 1924, develops uh, tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis kills one in seven during this time in America and in uh, Europe. It's the worst disease. They called it consumption at that time. He develops it. And Nathan, who again owns this company, really likes this young man. He's only 24. And he says, you need to go to Santa Fe because there's a sanatorium there and we'll get you healthy. We'll get you back up on your feet. And so he goes there and he does. He does get better. And he works for the company, the goldsmith uh, company, for another two years. He makes jewelry. It's all gold sends it back to New York, and then he decides to open his own company, which is the Thunderbird Company. This is in 1927. Now, 
he not only opens that company, but he has a wife that he meets. And this is very important. This is Aurora. And Sam tells me, he goes, you can't tell this story, Mark, unless you really understand how important my grandmother was to the business. So it was not just Frank. It was also Aurora and her sister, Mirandi. So the, they're also immigrants. And they are Italian immigrants that live in Germany. Then they go to Italy. They have the war. They finally get to America to meet their husband. He is just like Sam's uh, father, was, great great grandfather was. He was working in America, in Gallup, New Mexico, as a coal miner. So the kids, there's four little girls. His, his, his grandmother, grandmother was the oldest. They come over on the train. And when they get to Albuquerque, tragedy hits. She, her, her his mother gets very ill. They take her off the, off the train, and she dies. So they have four little girls, and the father is somewhere in Gallup. He gets wind of what happens. He writes back, and he's ill. He also probably has tuberculosis, and he's working in a coal mine. He dies. So now she and the four, the four little girls are in an orphanage in Santa Fe. And so they grow up, and they meet Frank Sr. in a hospital. That's where Aurora meets, her, meets Frank. They fall in love, and they get married in 1930. And in 1932, they have your father. And he also, just like his, uh, his father, works in the back of a jewelry store. This time, it is the, their store, which is the Thunderbird shop. Now, they have a shop in Santa Fe, in 1927, and they opened one here in Tucson in November of 1936. A lot of you probably have went to some of the different stores over the years. And Sam's father, Junior, Frank Junior, he has a different sense of how he wants to see the world, right? He sees it in a more modern sense as well as architectural sense. And when his father, his, his father, not Sam's, his grandfather, dies in February of 1964, then his father, Sam's father, takes over running the Thunderbird shop. And then, in 1961, he's born. <laughs> and after he graduates high school in 1979, he does just like his father before him and his grandfather before him. And he works in the back of the store. He becomes a great silversmith, goldsmith. And then he also goes into the business as soon as he graduates. So now Sam's going to tell you from here on the rest of the story. <laughs> but I want you to think about all the things that had to go on, right, to allow him to be here tonight. You know, you had a major earthquake. It was actually the largest earthquake in Europe, and I think it still may be for deaths anywhere in Europe. He had to have orphans because of the deadliest disease, consumption, TB. And everything had to come together. And Nathan Stern had to take that trip to Santa Fe in 1911, or he would have never ended up in Santa Fe, because he probably would have died in consumption in New York City. And so now Sam is going to tell you the rest of the story. Yeah, Sam. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm not much of a public speaker. I'm going to refer to my notes quite often, I'm afraid. Um, but I wanted to start by talking about my passion for jewelry. And I've often asked myself this when I was younger. Um, what is my passion for jewelry? What keeps me going in it? And I have no idea. Um, <laughs> you know, I had this opportunity growing up in this family to do this, but I fell in love with it. You know, it wasn't a given that I was going to do this. It was much more that way for my dad when he was uh, out of college. Um, but uh, one of the things that I really love about jewelry is that it's my art that becomes part of your family. You know, like your mom wore a signature cuff or a necklace or concho belt, and it was, that was just mom. She wouldn't go anywhere without it. And your dad might have worn a belt buckle and wouldn't feel dressed without that. Um, 
that's what really touches me as an artist, that people are willing to spend their money on my art. It's the highest high that I've ever had. I really enjoy that. Uh, like Mark said, um, my grandfather was driven out of uh, Sicily by the largest earthquake and tsunami in modern European history. 800,000 people died. So he must have just been awash in death as a nine-year-old, a ten-year-old. Um, and they, and um, so they left to come join uh, their, his father in New York City. And my grandmother's story is just as amazing. Her town of Feltre, which was in Austria at that time, was occupied by none, none other than Erwin Rommel, who was an uh, officer in the German army in World War I. Um, and I actually saw that in his book. I was just floored. Uh, and, and on the train out, like Mark said, their mother died, and there's four sisters. My grandmother Aurora is the oldest, and she has three younger sisters. They don't speak the language. Neither did my grandfather when he came to the United States. What do you do as a 12-year-old when you've got three younger sisters and you don't speak the language? You have no idea what the, you know, what, what's in store for you. Um, and my grandfather's American dream started in the slums of Little Italy where he got tuberculosis. And I'm eternally grateful for tuberculosis. Otherwise, we would have been New Yorkers. And I love New York, and I love New Yorkers, but I need the sky. Um, you know, he, he came, uh, my grandfather came out to recover from TB, like Mark said. And, you know, you, you arrive in Santa Fe, especially from the East Coast, and there are sunsets, you know, that are magnificent. And you smell the rain and the piñon, and you eat the pozole, and how, how are you not going to fall in love with that? It's, it's especially, I think, in the 20s, must have been paradise for him. And there was just no way he was going back to New York City, uh, much to Nathan Stern's um, you know, regret. Um, and Santa Fe, of course, was just a little town at that time. A um, lot of, of course, Native American, Hispanic, and then there's this art colony there too, of writers and poets and musicians. Scientists come later, uh, you know, to Los Alamos. But everyone comes into Santa Fe, and it's just such a wonderful mix. And then there's the food. I, you know, I got to mention that again. Um, and they all gathered in his store. He opened right on the plaza, essentially catty corner from La Fonda Hotel. And my great aunt, uh, the youngest of the four sisters my, uh, of my grandmother's, had a, a round table dedicated to her every afternoon in La Fonda, where artists and poets and writers would meet. Can you imagine that? I can't even imagine where that happens anymore, if that happens anymore. Um, well, they got married and opened the store in 1927, as Mark said. Um, they had three kids, my two aunts, Sylvia and Joan, and my dad was the middle child, which is always the weirdest one, <laughs> uh, me being the baby. Um, and Aurora and Frank, my grandparents, were a real team in the business. There's the art, and then you don't survive unless there's a business. And so just like my son and his wife are doing, she took care of the business, and he took care of the art. Um, his style, as he developed it over the years, what he's really known for, and what's in the Smithsonian's permanent collection, is a piece of his, um, I mean, how to, to get this going? Okay, there he is. This is my grandfather, and this is the oldest photograph I have of his. He looks like a teenager. He looks uh, dressed as an Italian. He's not looking terribly American there. Um, 
so this, just, this fascinates me, this picture. But here's the piece that's actually in the Smithsonian. Um, I actually had a, a customer come in and say, I want to give you this bracelet. I'm, well, wait, this is, this is valuable. I can't just accept this. You know, it really startled me. I had no idea this was gonna, ever going to happen. I mean, who does that? Um, and she said, give it to a museum. So I, OK, and I put it in my safe. And it stayed there for, I don't know, 10, 15 years until uh, we had the opportunity for, to, to get it into the Smithsonian. But he, he started using floral designs. He had a real uh, Mediterranean sense about his work. This was very different from what was going on in Native American silver and turquoise at the time in the Southwest. He's probably the first one to use leaves. This was in the 20s and 30s. And making flower designs with his, with his uh, silversmithing. Um, and I, I just love this style. Uh, to me, my grandparents, uh, Frank and Aurora, it was just sort of a magical, like, Camelot feeling that I had when I was around them. They had this beautiful home in Santa Fe up above an arroyo, and we just saw what it sold for, like, last year. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and it was just, like, mystical. And, and then, you know, I would see my dad going, yeah, that's my dad. I mean, get over it. What about me? Yeah. Um, uh, Dad was born in 32. Well, let's look more at Frank Sr.'s designs. Uh, clusters of turquoise. Do you know how much turquoise you have to have to be able to pick a set like that? You need at least 10 times that much turquoise to pick a set like that, to make the match height and color and hue and matrix. And it's, it's crazy how much material you have to have. But that's what was available at the time. This was a collection of my aunts who just recently passed away. Um, the coral you see there, they, uh, Frank and Aurora took a trip to Italy in the 50s, mid 50s, and bought a ton of coral in um, Torre del Greco, which I still have some of. Uh, let's see, where are we here? This is another one of his very typical flower patterns that he loved using. He was an avid gardener. Ah, now we come to my dad. He was born in 32. Uh, he uh, grew up in Santa Fe, which just must have been wild at the time. It was just, again, it was such a stimulating place. To me, it's like a place for eating and napping. <laughs> and what else are you going to do there? Um, he went to U of A, graduated from U of A, was an ROTC officer, a 90-day wonder. Um, he did his military service afterwards. And then uh, he married, had three kids, got divorced, and was a hippie. He wanted to live a very free lifestyle. Apparently, it was free of kids lifestyle. <laughs> um, I love my dad, but i got to be honest. Um, this is the piece of his that's in the Smithsonian. Um, this was the one that's in the Smithsonian he actually made for my mother um, in the 60s. And uh, I actually have one here. He made two of them. I have one, and there's one in the Smithsonian. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. Um, my dad was a world traveler. Uh, I think Africa was the only continent he didn't make it to. Um, and he was uh, imported New Guinea work, New Guinea tribal art for decades with his best junior high school friend. Um, and both my my, my dad uh, did many uh, competitions, national and local competitions, which you won. Hey, what happened? Um, there. Uh, and he really got involved with this modernist style. That's really what he's known for in his early work. He 
you know, he had an organic style that was very much different from my grandfather's. My dad is a pure craftsman. I, my grandfather and I beat things with a hammer. My father does scale drawings. You know, he's very thought out. He plans everything very well. And he's the finest craftsman I've ever met. Um, and I really admire his ability to do that. This piece traveled around the world for a young American's art, art uh, show. Uh, went through the Soviet Union. I actually have a publication in Russian that was an American publication, but written with a photo of that piece in it, which is right some here. Um, so to me, that's just, this is the essence of my father, his work. And I love it. Um, my dad's idea of, about his work was design is everything. Materials do not matter. Materials are a lesser importance than design. My feeling was, wow, what if my grandfather had made that in 18 karat? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, and they both had very different styles, designs, but there was a lot of crossover between them, and we made my, we still make my grandfather's style work. Um, I was born in 1961 at Tucson Medical Center. Are there any of you here? Yeah, there we go. Um, I grew up going to the gem show, so that was going to figure very big in my career as a silversmith. I hated going to the gem show <laughs> with my dad. It was so boring um, until I became a teenager, oddly enough, and I fell in love with it. And I just started thinking, wow, I really want to use that color. That color is just amazing and that kind of a thing. I apprenticed to my dad. I actually took a high school class with him um, and my sister um, for high school credit. And dad made a very formal class and, and taught us. And my sister was so much better than I was. Um, but she became an engineer. Um, I, uh, my mother, whose name is Gail, um, was also very interested in world travel. And she got a job teaching in Tehran, Iran in 1978. Uh, I went with her. And so I was in Iran for a year before the shit hit the fan. Um, and that was very, that was extremely interesting. Um, seeing the Islamic art, which to me just seemed so constricted, it was so regimented, until I started actually working uh, for a living making jewelry. And I realized that those restrictions actually gave you a lot of freedom, gave me a lot of freedom in my art. I wasn't gonna do everything. I have a certain number of years to work and, and I better narrow it down and that became more and more apparent to me as time went on. I was the uh, generation, oh wait, oh, well, here's another piece of my dad's, I'm sorry. This is a forged, very organic swan cuff. And he made those in sterling and 14 karat gold. And again, this is just, I love it. Uh, I was the generation that straddled the all manual business model to computers. And uh, that was no mean feat for a small business. Um, and that was a complete reinvention of the business. You know, there's the business and the art. I took over um, the business in the, I don't know, the mid 90s, something like that. And this is one of the pieces I made um, Marco's mother, one of the first pieces I did on my own with colored stones from the gem show. And I worked in gold and silver in this one. I had uh, kids, 
my two oldest, Marco and his sister Celia, and fell in love with being a dad. Um, and as time went on, uh, my, my work, my career bent around them in terms of how much time I could spend at the studio versus when my kids need me as a single father. Um, I've, I've had opportunities to teach jewelry. I've taught jewelry quite a bit over my career. I've taught in Florida. What was, that was really fun. I've taught in Tucson quite a bit. Um, and uh, Marco started working with me about 12 years ago. Um, I had to homeschool my youngest son during COVID, so there was not a whole lot of time for the career. Um, but that was really a neat time. I got to know my youngest son in a way that I would never have the opportunity otherwise. And I really grabbed onto that. Um, most of the work that we do is fairly solitary. I um, don't like to take pictures of things that I'm making, like in process pictures, because I'm scared to death that it's not going to work out. <laughs> and I'll be damned if anybody sees it until I'm ready to show it. Maybe that just means I'm controlling. I don't know. Um, so to me, doing my art, doing my craft is very private. Um, along the way, I, you know, COVID closed this public studio, so now I work out of a private area. And I was always very envious of my dad's and grandfather's ability to have a workshop full of craftsmen making their designs. So there's the Thunderbird Shop pieces that are hallmarked on the back, designating them as Thunderbird Shop pieces that were made by the craftsmen that the Patania family trained and employed to make. And then there's the individual pieces that have our personal hallmarks on them that my grandfather actually made and my dad actually made and I actually made and now Mark collect actually makes. And so we tried to straighten out the Hallmark situation. Dad wrote an article that's available through our website uh, if you'd like to read that. But then um, I, I started working with a company out of Rhode Island and all of a sudden I had a workshop full of top-notch craftsmen to make my designs. And I started working with a guy that does digital drawings that can be printed in 3D and create jewelry that way. That was a real renaissance for me. It was so exciting to work with this guy in this workshop who could make our, make our jewelry for us exactly the same way that all those guys, they're not as funny as the guys in the workshop. And, and I was hoping that Marco would be the first generation of Patanias that were not teased by Native Americans, but that wasn't to be either. Um, but the, these guys just don't even measure up in Rhode Island, but they're fantastic craftsmen. So we have what, I, what we call our Patania collection, which are pieces that were bestsellers of three generations, now four generations, that we can have made for us in a workshop with top-notch craftsmen that I didn't have to train. That's, that's monumental. My grandfather never employed craftsmen. He employed friends of the guys working there, and he would train everybody and provide tools and all the materials and all of that. My dad did the very same thing, but boy, that's expensive nowadays. So it, it was really exciting to, for me as an artist to have the hands of the artist move all the way to Rhode Island with me not having to leave Tucson. Um, so this, that piece, there's another piece in, in heavily influenced by the um, gem show, falling in love with gems. I met a man here in Tucson who was a designer of stone cutting gems. Uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. But, and he published his designs and he was very well known in the area and internationally and he taught me all there was about colored stones. So I, I could teach you how to judge a, a well-cut stone in about two minutes. 
if you're interested. Um, here's more of my early work, again, in gold and silver and colored stones. Uh, then I had another friend who had a store on 4th Avenue, and he would sell me stuff like the Sugilite, which was completely odd-shaped, um, but just wonderful, beautiful stuff. Opal and diamond. This is... I, we had a show in 1999. It was the Tucson Museum of Art Stonewall Foundation show. And I used that show to do a bunch of gold and platinum work with diamonds and colored stones. The big uh, deal in my family is to differentiate, differentiate ourselves from the previous generation. Um, so that's what I did. That's what I used that show for. And this is the kind of work that I was making. Those are the most beautiful opal I'd ever worked with. Um, here's another example of my work. Where I, turquoise is our passion. We just love turquoise. I, you know, I'm a recognized turquoise expert if you have questions about that kind of stuff. But um, so here I'm combining uh, an 18 karat gold, which is my favorite material. 18 karat gold and platinum are my absolute favorites. Silver and turquoise is like old home for me. I love going back to that. Um, but I also like doing this kind of stuff. Um, my, we, my grandfather, this was part of his cache of coral that he bought in Torre del Greco in the mid-50s, and it was very organic. I'm like, God, it just really bugged me. What am I going to do with that? Um, so I came up with, with this, that style. Um, this is a, another one of my pieces uh, where I, this to me looks very Mediterranean. Of course, the coral is. Um, so I also got that influence from my, my grandfather. Here's more of that very free-form coral that I just was bugged by for decades until I figured out, wow, this is what I can do with this. And this is a cuff in sterling silver. My process, um, I don't draw. I'm, I'm really lousy at drawing, um, which makes it hard to deal with customers. Um, but I've had a whole bunch of customers who just trusted me, uh, which is just shocking to me. Um, I mean, who would, you know, but, the, you know, they're spending some money to, to have something made, and I can't even show them what I'm thinking. It's a real problem. You guys are laughing. You should be crying for me right now. Um, I guess that didn't work. Um, so I usually just start out in the metal. Even if it's gold and platinum, I just start in the metal. Sometimes I'm inspired by a stone. Sometimes I'm inspired by the metal. Uh, sometimes it's... This, Combining a stone with a metal, uh, new techniques fascinate me, so I'm always looking uh, for new ways to do things. That's what I loved about the digital drawing. Um, you know, one of the things that I like that I've been working on actually with the digital artist is like this picture frame back here. I'm going to come out with bolo ties and belt buckles with that gold frame looking idea with stones in it, <clears throat> I, you know, I'll be able to do all kinds of stuff inside that. But my dad has a Rastafan that has a frame similar to that. And it's, it's just intrigued me for years. So, you know, I get ideas like that. Um, I, architectural uh, elements, like the edging on the Pioneer Building, really got to me early on, and I started making things like that. So when you're down there, take a look at that. Um, here's some of my work. Now, that's pretty darn organic right there. Um, this was some premium Bisbee that I had. I got, I got from a friend of mine who lived in Bisbee. Um, and it's platinum and 18 karat gold. Uh, but then, you know, I tip back and forth between, you know, organic and then something like this, which to me looks Egyptian for some reason. But those were some amazing, uh, I think it was tourmaline, um, that I got from my friend Jeff Graham, who was the man who, who did cut designing. So I get to jump back and forth between the two major influences in my career, my grandfather and my dad. I also <clears throat> love um, uh, Spratling in Tosco, Jensen, 
Um, you know, those are, that's the kind of stuff I really love. This was actually a, a cuff that I carved out of platinum. Now, nobody does that. Nobody in their right mind does that. Because you're trying to be very conservative with a metal like platinum and gold. And I don't want to be conservative with those metals. That's one of my main objectives is to be somewhat outrageous like this piece with expensive materials. Because it's really hard to bring yourself a, as a craftsman or artist to spend that kind of money and make something crazy. It's easier to be conservative and put some diamonds in there and just, you know, shut up brain, let's just do this and make a sale kind of a thing. Um, let's see, where are we? This is my piece that's in the Smithsonian. It's uh, 18 karat white gold with a tourmaline that Jeff Graham cut. Um, and it is sort of a fusion between grandfathers and dads. It's very much influenced by dads, but then it's got these curving elements that go up and, you know, that to me is my grandfather. Um, you know, here's a pretty organic piece, very much influenced by my grandfather, made in a way that he didn't make stuff. Um, this was actually sapphire. 18 karat gold and sterling silver. Um, one of the things that this workshop in Rhode Island allows me to do is to reinterpret dad's and grandfather's designs and offer them at a not vintage kind of a price range. This, of course, is this. Um, Shrunk down, most of jewelry today is extremely petite, which I'm not terribly a fan of. But um, so I, you know, I'm able to do this kind of work. Now, the only way I would ever attempt this kind of thing is to do it digitally, because it took dad days to make that thing, and it's a larger scale. So to shrink it down is is uh, just nothing I was really willing to do. But once I started working with this guy, it opened up that path for me. Uh, again, this is this is one of our best-selling rings. It's a, di a direct result of one of Dad's designs, but again, made with uh, the most high-tech tools available. Um, and uh, that, uh, that's why well, you know I make a bracelet and earrings and ring with that, and several different colors. All of the gemstone work is influenced by my dad because my grandfather did very very little. He did very little gold work too. But there is a piece at the, at the Medicine Man Gallery that's gold that he made. I mean, it's, it's hen's teeth. Um, Dad dabbled in gold a little bit and gemstones because, again, the gemstone, every year the whole world comes to us here. It's just incredible, I, you know, that I grew up in this town and it was, you know, the smallest town in India knows about Tucson because of the gem show. You can go anywhere and talk to any, in the gem world and talk about Tucson. They know about Tucson because it's the biggest show of its kind in the world. Here's some more of my gemstone work in, in silver. I have this piece on the table. It's influenced by Matisse's flowers, which I just love, and they translate really well into metal, into silver and an amazing uh, high dome Bisbee stone. A bolo tie that I did that Mark sold for me. And a Matisse belt buckle. <clears throat> um, that Matisse and this piece were ordered by a guy that, le that will collaborate for about five minutes and then he goes, okay, that sounds good, go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, I have a track record with him, making him belt buckles, but I didn't at first, and he just, he would let me work. It was just, an, it's just incredible. Here's another piece that I have on the table here with Bisbee turquoise and, and sterling silver. I just love coming back to sterling and, and, and uh, turquoise. Here's some modernist work of mine in a belt buckle. Um, you know, how I come up with that, I, I really don't know. I, I started with the framework 
and I made it in a way that I had never seen done before by notching them together like Lincoln logs. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well that's neat. What do I put inside it? And just picked through my stones and came up with two pieces that I really liked and, and this was the result. This, I was on a mission to make bracelets that didn't look like bracelets. That was my driving force. I think I succeeded. But once they're on, they're, they're, they're very interesting. A uh, stone that my dad bought decades ago that I had and you know, carved quartz crystal. And then I wanted to use silver and turquoise in ways that, aren't, that you haven't seen before. And I have one of those pieces up here. I think Mark sold all the other ones. I just wanted to use these wonderful ancient jewelry type of stones and something that you'd never seen before. And that's really what I was striving for. And I'm always influenced by uh, astronomical things. I think I call this my nebula series. And this, this piece is also up here. This is a magnific magnificent stone that my grandfather bought that we still had. Uh, so I really had to honor it and, you know, not screw it up. That, sometimes that's my biggest impetus. Um, some more amazing turquoise. I just love turquoise. I could go on and on about it, but I see you're already glazing over. So. <laughs> There's that, uh, I call that a, uh, what do I call that? Uh, to me, it looked like uh, a spacecraft. Um, you know, with all kinds of crazy antennas coming off of it and information gathering devices. And this is what I call star map. Um, again, incorporating gemstones and turquoise in high carat gold, I love doing that. And that's old vintage turquoise, number eight turquoise that my grandfather bought in the 30s. I still have. This is some of my son's work. This is actually the same bracelet and the color's way off on this. It's a much more bright blue turquoise. Um, one of the things that I was able to translate my dad's designs into workable pieces for my Rhode Island workshop, but my grandfather eluded me for 20 years on how to do that. I finally figured it out probably earlier this year, and we've been getting a lot of attention about his work because of the book. Um, and people are like, well, did you make things like that? And I'm like, no. Um, but I finally cracked it, and then we're really able to make pieces that are my interpretation of my grandfather's work. And I think it's pretty true to form. Actually, you know what I did was we had unfinished elements that he had made before he died in 64 that I still have. I sent those in to be molded and copied. So I'm actually using his work in a very real sense to make these pieces. Is that it? That's some of Marco's work. This is some of more Marco's work. This is heavily family influenced, but he just knocked it out of the ballpark. We sold the one on the bottom left just recently. Um, he's using fantastic Bisbee turquoise on the one on the upper right, and that's it, medicine man. And this is another collection of Marco's work. And he took a class in, in uh, Maine at a place called Haystack uh, to make stamp, to, uh, where he learned how to make his own steel stamps. And he does some of the finest stamp work I've ever seen. I'm just, I'm so proud of him. And uh, his work is really inspiring to me. Um, you know, it just gives me energy. And uh, I think that's pretty much my my talk tonight, I wanted to let you know that we started this book, Pat and Kim Messier are the authors. I was not an author of this book. I provided our archives. I provided um, information as I could. Um, we started in 2020, and it took three years to make this book. And I just think they did such a fantastic job. I'm so proud of them. I can't even believe that this exists. Uh, but this is the authoritative history of my family and jewelry. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk.